Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good whatever it is in whatever time zone you are in, and welcome to the University Consultants of America College Admissions Town Hall. Uh, we're pleased to have people from around the country, and I think even a uh, few, few uh, international uh, attendees here today. So uh, welcome. Oftentimes, this time of year, uh, we like to hit the road uh, and go uh, present news about college admissions to our students and families around the country. Uh, unless you have been asleep for the past six months, you're probably aware of why we're not hitting the road right now. Uh, but that works out well for us because it means we're actually able uh, to put a group together like the group we have uh, for you here today, uh, which we would never uh, be able to put together, uh, like I say, with some of the road shows we do. Uh, so my name is Bill Watson Canning. Uh, I am the president of the University Consultants of America. Uh, with us today, we have Bob Levine, who is the CEO and founder uh, of UCA. Uh, we have a couple of uh, parents here of uh, students who have used our services in the past. Uh, Martin Zamudia uh, is an immigration attorney. Uh, he is also the father of, do I have this correct, a rising junior at Columbia and an incoming freshman at Yale University? Yes. All right, I, I, I thought I had that right. Uh, we also have Jeff Malk. Uh, who is the proud father of an incoming freshman at Williams College uh, in Northwestern Massachusetts, right around the corner from where my parents live, one of my favorite uh, schools in the country. Uh, I'm going clockwise for how I see it on my screen. I have no idea how you all see uh, all of us on your screen, uh, but uh, Natalia Ayub here is uh, a student at the University of Southern California, uh, where she's headed back tomorrow. Wow. Oh. Yeah, well, thanks for joining <laughs> us uh, uh, right before you return to, to whatever's in store for you there. Uh, Natalia has also uh, interned with us, uh, and so she has seen uh, student work from, from both sides. Uh, having been a student not too long ago, uh, applying to college, uh, and now seeing uh, many students who are. And uh, we also have Michael Strobel, uh, who is a rising junior uh, at Yale University. Uh, so. Uh, soon to be a uh, fellow student with Martin's son. Uh, Michael is uh, famous in some of these presentations for having written the little Mikey box dropper essay uh, that we like to read. Uh, Michael, I promise you we will not read it today uh, with, with, with you sitting right there. Uh, so uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little, but really what's going to make this uh, productive uh, is the questions that, that you people ask. Um, we have a number of resources beyond just uh, Bob and myself here today, uh, and we're really hoping for a sort of lively discussion and response from people who've been deeply connected uh, to the actual admissions process not too long ago. Uh, but while you contemplate your questions, uh, we did want to sort of give a general overview of what we were seeing. Uh, I often say every time I log on to one of these calls, by the time I log off, my phone is lighting up with lots of new news about college admissions. Uh, but uh, I've had my phone off since 4.55. Bob, what's new in the world of admissions? Um, quite a bit. I want to read a statement about something that um, most people may not be that familiar with. Uh, and so let me just read this and then we'll talk about some opportunities that come along with challenges. It is no surprise that COVID-19 has upset the American college experience. Most universities have switched to online learning. Many offer only online learning. Some have refused to allow the international students to study in the US this year. The pandemic has also affected college admissions. Campus tours are not available. Testing requirements such as SAT, ACT, and subject tests have changed to test optional. Test dates have been added, but individual tests have been canceled, and test centers have also closed for certain examination dates. UCA believes that this admission cycle will be the most challenging in history. We want you to understand a hidden problem that will dramatically affect the high school class of 2021. Many students who would otherwise have begun college this fall are choosing to defer their enrollment and take what is known as a gap year before starting school. Although this happens to some degree every year, it is happening at a much higher rate this year. Last week, Harvard reported that 20% of its freshman class has decided to wait a year. Other schools are noticing huge increases, 
MIT students deferred admission at a rate seven times more than usual. At Williams College and Bates College, the factor is 2.5 times higher than normal, and overall we estimate that three times more students are delaying their entry into college. That's a problem for next year's admissions class. Where will the universities house a new class, plus the holdovers who took a gap year? And with our newfound focus on public health, will the schools keep the same density of students in the dormitory rooms, or will they house fewer students? For the first time, high school seniors will be competing for college opportunities with an inordinately large group of students who have already been accepted into the colleges of their choice. The odds have gotten worse for you, significantly worse. And with all the changes this year, there are new strategies which are critical to student success in college admissions. The first thing I wanna say about that is this, it will be okay. There are opportunities even amongst the challenges. Today, we wanna to talk about two strategies, at least for the moment. The first, contact them. The admissions people are there and they're waiting for you. They will literally pick up the phone. I was talking to a admissions rep from DePaul University last week and I said, we always recommend our students actually call you. She said, yes, yes, we want that. We're waiting for you or you don't. You see, you're trying to create a relationship and by interacting with them, not only do you learn more about the school, but the school learns more about you. They're out there, they're waiting. Instead of worrying about a college visit, find out how to contact them virtually, by phone, whatever you can do. The second strategy comes from an understanding of the economics of university education. This is an education industry, but just because the word education is before the word industry, doesn't mean it's not an industry. Money is important. And let us understand what happens when a university does not have, let's say, 500 or 1,000 students to pay for tuition, room and board, costs, and all the other things that make up their finances. And let us also understand that they are expending greater monies to do the online learning, something they've never done before. This is a challenge. Most universities really don't have that much profit built into their yearly budget. This is an opportunity. We saw it start in April. Our seniors, our class of 2020, could make phone calls to the admissions office and by the end of that phone call could double the scholarships that were being presented. For those in the class of 2021, there's a strategy. Look past the usual suspects. Look towards the number of amazing schools that are out there. At UCA, we recommend over 250 different colleges. Not all for everybody, but colleges make good sense for you and might fit you. It is in those schools that people don't always clamor for that incredible economic opportunities are there. Uh, one of the things that we did not mention in talking about Natalia is that she was lucky enough or skilled enough or just plain good enough to get an incredible scholarship. Money is out there. That's what they use to attract you. So if you interact with them more, demonstrate your interest, find out more, start the relationship now, even before the application is filed. And if you make sure your, your list is broadened, you're going to get some great results. And that means when you make your decision, most likely in April, you may have some incredible choices, not just caliber of education, but also lower cost. So it's different and it's changing every couple of weeks. So we just want you to know that there are answers and our clients are getting them all the time. So to those of you who are working with UCA, please read your bulletins, please read your newsletters, please reach out to us. There are some incredible opportunities. But I wanna turn it over to Bill now because something else that's happened over the last months has to do with testing such as SAT, NACT, and subject tests. Incredible changes 
but is it good or bad? Well, yeah, it's the, it's the one thing that everybody seems to, well, I guess a couple of things people know about uh, college admissions right now that I get asked about uh, when I'm, well, not out and about, but uh, when, I, when I'm talking to people. Uh, one is, of course, campus closures. Those are going to pass eventually. Eventually, people will be back on campus. Uh, but the other thing everybody knows about is that pretty much every school in the country at this point has gone test optional. Uh, and some schools have indicated that they may go test optional beyond just this year. University of California system has already announced they'll be test optional for at least 2024 and that they expect to go test optional permanently. Uh, and this can be exciting to students because they think, oh, thank God, I don't have to deal with the SAT anymore. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, not necessarily so. Uh, let's, let's talk about uh, sort of test optional thing. Uh, it's not completely new. There have been schools that have been test optional for years. Way back in the dark ages when Bob and I were applying to college, Bates was already a test optional school. I mentioned Bates a few minutes ago. Uh, University of Chicago, uh, Wake Forest can be, has been test optional for years. Uh, test optional does not mean test blind. If you apply to the University of Chicago with a 36 on your ACT, no admissions officer at the University of Chicago is going to say, oh, I wish you hadn't shown me that. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, you are trying to give schools reasons to take you, uh, reasons to build up your resume uh, so that they will think of you as somebody who needs a space in their incoming class. And if, the, if, you're, if you have a test score that is going to be an asset to your application, you're going to want that. Uh, and if you don't, uh, that's, you know, you, you are asking everything else on your application to do more work. Now, one thing we used to see historically with test optional schools is students would consider it sort of a get out of jail free. I don't have to report my test. Uh, therefore, I can apply to school. For those of you who can hear us right now, Apparently, there's a storm in the beautiful home office of UCA in downtown-ish Tampa, Florida. <laughs> so technical lurch, which clearly will not be a problem for any of the universities, um, but, but we're going to continue. Sorry about that. Uh, as, yeah. we, as we reboot everybody, I want to remind that if you use either the Q&A or the chat function, we're going to talk, answer your questions, and that's kind of the most fun part of all this. So, Bill, um, we kind of lost it somewhere around. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just dive quickly back into test optional. Um, where we have seen test optional succeed for students in the past is when students had particular issues with testing, uh, but otherwise had an exemplary uh, application to submit. Uh, I have a student who is headed to Notre Dame uh, this fall. Uh, Notre Dame was test optional uh, last year for international students. Uh, this was a student who just couldn't get a test score that was commensurate with the rest of her GPA, with the rest of her activities list, with everything else about her. Uh, in that case, test optional can be a strategy, but why go into application season needing to use that strategy? It is still August. You still have time to take the test. Uh, I would go out there and try and get the best test score that you possibly can, uh, and that is our advice around test optional. Um, you, you, you do have the option now. If you're just not able to get the score, yes, you can rely on the rest of your application. Uh, but as of August 13th, please try for that test. Yeah, absolutely. You can't really come up with a strategy of what works better until you get your best possible score and figure that out. Uh, I've been interviewing admission deans and officers and readers over the last two weeks uh, for an article that will be published in the Harvard Crimson newspaper next week trying to figure out what really makes them pick students. And one thing that they said about this year is they're stressing. Without those test scores, they're going to focus more on the transcript and they're going to focus a lot more on the essays. So as Bill said, it's really not a get out of jail free card. Let's do our best. Just don't run away from the challenge. So there you go. Um, what I'd like to do now is kind of get some words in from uh, our parents. Uh, I'm gonna start with Jeff. Uh, as we said, Jeff Malk, uh, son Jack, will be going off to Williams, which according to US News is the number one ranked small liberal arts college. Congratulations for that. Uh, and, and Jeff and Martins are both gonna kind of share their experiences, what it's like to be a parent during this 
really stressful college admissions process. So Jeff, give us some advice. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, yeah, Jack applied to uh, various schools uh, around the country. He was uh, fortunate to get into some of them. Um, and uh, ultimately, he decided uh, between uh, William, um, Pomona, which is on the West Coast in California, and Williams, which is uh, on the East Coast. And he, uh, after doing some research and talking to some uh, students at uh, various schools um, that he was accepted to, he focused on those two schools and um, ultimately uh, chose Williams because he likes the uh, curriculum there, he likes the community there, he likes the professors there. Um, but also, um, he liked the location, and it was a, um, he considered uh, the West Coast, but ultimately, he wanted to be not that far away. And so, um, I think that if we had given some parameters when we started to um, exclude um, perhaps those schools that were further away, the uh, decision-making process would have been a little bit easier um, to focus on those schools that are closer, that are um, still um, a good fit. Um, and so um, for that reason, Jack wanted to go to uh, Williams because it was a good fit for him and um, was uh, um, hit all of the boxes that he wanted to uh, to check. And so he's he's excited about going to Williams and um, um, it was, uh, it's it's a good process and um, he's in a, he's in a good place. Were you in a good place during this whole process? I know that, that you and uh, your wife were, did a pretty good job of backing off of Jack a little bit. What would be your be advice for the parents to survive this whole thing? Well, um, we told Jack that uh, he had worked hard in school, that um, we wanted him to explore all the opportunities that he had available to him and to um, uh, apply to those schools that he was interested in. Um, and that's what he did. Um, the advice would be that um, apply to those schools that you you and your child can really see yourselves attending. Um, and if there is a school that is um, either too far away um, or not the right climate, um, for example, if it's too cold, then it's okay to exclude those schools because if you get into those schools, but um, at the end of the day, either they're too far or the climate isn't a climate that you wanna live in for four years, that further complicates the process uh, because you're considering schools that ultimately you're probably gonna reject anyway. Um, and so um, what we learned along the way was to um, set some parameters in terms of uh, what schools um, are really going to be in the mix that you can really see yourself attending um, and focus on those, do your research on those, um, which I think makes the decision-making process that much easier. What you seem to be talking about, whether it's weather or culture, is the idea of fit, that Jack made his decision based upon where he could prosper as opposed to what's number one in the rankings? Oh, clearly. Um, in fact, uh, the number one in rankings really wasn't that much of a consideration for Jack. Um, Jack did a lot of research on uh, lots of different schools um, and got on chat groups with students at some of these schools to see what was the best fit, where he got the best vibe, he looked at classes, um, looked at professors, um, and um, was pretty thorough in his um, research to determine where he thought he would fit in the best, uh, including um, 
what the culture, as you suggest, Bob, uh, was like at each school um, and how engaged uh, the students can be uh, on campus, whether or not there's any um, uh, division between um, uh, students and athletes, whether or not it's a uh, community campus um, where everybody is engaged. Um, and um, uh, that's ultimately how he got to his decision that he's very excited about. Well, one of the things that Jeff knows, Jack knows, I know, Nobody in history has done more research than Jeff's son. Trust me on that. And in fact, there was some frustration at the end because young Jack was paralyzed by the minutia that he was figuring out. And yet, ultimately, it just came down to feel. Am I right? Oh, sure. I mean, you can uh, analyze this uh, nine different ways, uh, but ultimately... Uh, it's about where uh, you yourself, um, uh, not only fitting, but thriving. Um, where is it that um, you feel like uh, you will be, uh, have an opportunity to um, take class joy um, and be among people who are very similar in interests? Um, and so, yeah, um, at, at some point, you have to disregard the research uh, and go with uh, where do you feel like is the best fit for you. And ultimately that's what he did. Well, and, and Martin's had a bit of a different path because he had two of them. And so uh, older daughter blazing the trail, younger son going along. Uh, Martin's tell him about what it was like for you and, and your family. Thank you. It, it was generally challenging. Um, I met Bill about seven years ago. Just start from how I met him as with our mutual friend Mary, and they were talking about the SAT for Africa. But two years later, I realized I needed Bill for my first child, Desu. And there's great difference between Desu and Norma, the, my younger son who is going to yield. This is very strong headed, unlike Norma who is more like easy going. What is very important for parents from my experience is let the kids be what they wanna be. It was stressful, but when I realized how tough it was to deal with this, because this, you know, first of all, we went on um, school tour which was possible then, went to all the Ivy League schools, went to some other schools, and I gave the impression clearly that they know that Ivy League school is more very, very competitive and it's more lottery. It doesn't matter what you do, you just have to pray that you can get in because of the level of selectiveness of the schools. Um, this who had interest in Columbia after the visit and Norma had interest in Yale. The what made a difference in terms of the stress, how we're able to overcome it is working with them to achieve what they wanted to achieve. The essay, for example, in this case, you couldn't touch what she was doing. Bob would realize, <laughs> Bob knows that. She wanted her essay the way she wanted it. I mean, we couldn't do anything different. And look, it, it helped her eventually. She was able to get to her dream school, Columbia. So you need to let the kids be what they want to be. Of course, she wanted her particular essay the way she wanted it, but she was still able to rely on the guidance of UCA, you know? So that is very, very important. But what I would stress here is the need to go deep on your extracurricular activities. That is very important from the standpoint of my younger child, Norma, who is going to Yale. The point is, he got the basis course. Of course, if you don't get the SAT score the right way, GPA and extracurricular in general form, you don't have your foot in the door. He got that, but the difference basically was how deep he went in theater and uh, performing arts. I think that made a difference because the interviewer was very excited about how deep he went in extracurricular activities. So I would advise parents today to make sure that they support their kids when they want to do extracurricular activities. So long as they've met the basic academic requirement, 
because I know of parents that say, hey, you couldn't do band because you need to get your perfect GPA. Those kids couldn't get to Yale. I know about three of the friends wanted to go to Yale. I mean, it's difficult, but if you do the right thing, let the kid be what they want to be because when they go for the interview, it will show their passion. And the passion actually shows the fit. When we went to the school, to school tours, Norma, who is going to Yale now, felt very comfortable with Yale. We came back, he told me he wanted to go to Yale. And I said, oh God, you know how difficult? He said, yeah, I know, but I will get to Yale. Look, we did everything. UCA did perfect job with him. But I tell you what, the difference was in the interview. So don't take anything for granted. The, the, the admission officer said, look, the singular reason why we took your application and took interest in it was the recommendation. Everything spoke volume from the interviewer. So that is my experience in terms of how to get the bed. It's a very nerve wracking situation. It's challenging, but you will be there. You mean, you, there are so many opportunities, you know, you'll be there if you stick to it, you know, do what you need to do to support them and let them be what they want to be. They will get there. That's my experience. That's well, Martin's is, is spot on with our experience. We've worked with over a thousand students. Here's what we know. If you want to know how to get into the best universities in America or even the world, there is one type of student that usually gets in. We call them doers. These are people who do things naturally. They are self-motivated. They initiate all on their own. They don't need a helicopter parent. They don't need a tiger mom to tell them what to do. Mm. They just naturally do this. And what's interesting is that both Jeff and Martins have said today, support them. Don't pull them by the nose. That doesn't work. Now, do you guys agree with that? Like, as a parent, let them be their best and be supportive. Don't pull them. Yeah. Well, I now, agree. I remember, I remember towards the end, Martins was stressing a little bit because Noma wasn't super thrilled with his SAT score, but he was so busy doing everything else, he just didn't have time to do anything, but it was the everything else that got him in. So, so um, now we have the student experience. The parents have told you it's stressful, and we're going to turn towards uh, uh, our USC favorite, Natalia, who, again, after graduating from our IB school and getting this wonderful opportunity, has worked with us every summer and has a standing job offer if she wants. Remember that. It's on recording okay. now, Natalia. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and so she's seen it from the point of view of being that person and seeing what everybody else does as well as seeing the students. So Natalia, what kind of advice do you have for the uh, people who are watching today? Definitely. Um, number one, I would say stay calm and have some confidence in yourself. It is a long process, um, but the fact that you're here listening, trying to learn, that's really huge. And just I'm a natural procrastinator, so I understand the tendency to put things off towards the last minute. But I cannot stress enough how much of a difference it made um, for me and my experience to go into my senior year with my essay, my personal statement written. Um, so if it's not written, that's okay. Don't freak out, but definitely be working on it because unlike a lot of high school experiences, you don't write this in one day and submit it. This is a, a baby, a labor of love, something that you really work on. Um, and then to dive into some deeper advice, something that I would really stress um, that I learned by going through the process and then now by editing so many students' essays is that you really need to think of yourself as a brand and you need to have a story that you're trying to tell. Um, and basically you want to create, you, you need to do some reflection and some digging into yourself to figure out who am I? And often that's a daunting question, but try to get to the root of that. And then you want your application to really demonstrate who you are as a person. Every element of your application should touch on who you are as a person. Um, so I don't know, I was thinking about this kind of like if anyone watches Shark Tank and you have people come up and pitch themselves very quickly and you know try to get people to invest in them, that's essentially what you're doing as a student. You have a few application materials to really brand yourself and pitch yourself. 
and it's competitive. A ton of other people are doing it and there's potentially money on the line in a lot of cases. So you need to convince them, why am I going to give you a spot, invest in you and hope that you're going to make a difference on this campus. Um, so definitely do some thinking about who you want to be portrayed as. And some two specific things that I would mention also is that authenticity is so important. Um, really try to come across as yourself and not as a robot. You have your activities list for, you know, and your transcript for all your robotic elements that are just very black and white. Your essay and the rest of your application should showcase your personality. Um, and remember that there's other people on the other side who are reading your application. So it's people to people. And even though you might not be face to face until the interview, if you have an interview, just remember that it's another human being who's reading it. So you're trying to connect with them in some, in some way. So be authentic and be yourself, but make sure that you have a strong message that you're trying to convey that you remain um, consistent with throughout your application. Yeah, we, we call that here at UCA the personal thesis, the kind of foundational idea of who you are as a person individually as well as interacting with other people in the community. And I think that I say all the time, this is a lot like sales. It's not like trying to create a Pulitzer Prize winning essay. Uh, and sometimes rough is better. This is not the same as perfect grammar or what an English teacher would want. This is what the admissions people want. And before we get to Mike, I want to give you a statement that was written by Connor Brewer. Now, Connor used to hold a record here. She came in on November 17 and in six weeks was able to put together materials that got her into Stanford. She couldn't be with, her, with us today because she has a consulting company and suddenly had a client require a meeting. She's only been out of school for a year. Good for you, Connor. Uh, but she no longer holds the record because one of Bill's students came in last year on December 23 only wanting Stanford, and he's going to Stanford. But Connor was nice enough to uh, gift us with about 500 words about her Stanford experience. And I think it'll give you a lot of insight as to what they're looking on the other side. So here we go. How did I get into Stanford? I asked myself that every day during the summer before freshman year. I later found out that many of my classmates have been asking themselves that same question. During our first week of orientation, the president of Stanford got up in front of all the new freshmen and said to the auditorium, full of people with imposter syndrome, you were not a mistake. You didn't get here by accident. We looked at the whole person and we chose you. He then went on to list some impressive attributes of my classmates that helped them stand out amongst the other applicants. Winner of the National Spelling Bee. Inventor of three engineering patents. Olympic gymnastics champion, national president of Mu Alpha Theta. The list of impressive achievements went on and on, but the thing I never heard was, had a perfect ACT score, never got anything below an A plus in any class. Grades and scores were not all they cared about. I wasn't an Olympic gold medalist. I've never won a spelling bee. And I even got a B in sophomore year chemistry, yet there I was. I thought the admissions process would be highly competitive and in all honesty, it is. I thought that to stand out, I would have to list off every achievement, every success, every obstacle I've ever overcome and every difficulty I've ever faced. But in reality, they just wanted to know me. They wanted to know the things I'm proudest of, what excites me most and what my personality is like. Stanford wanted a diversity of thinkers, people with different interests and backgrounds. There was no cookie cutter student because all my classmates were different. For one of my essays, I wrote about how my favorite holiday is April Fool's and how it excites me to think about clever ways to apply engineering in devising elaborate pranks to fool my friends. For that very same essay, my roommate wrote about her passion for her high school softball team, while the girl across the hall wrote about how much she loves SpaceX. There is no right thing to write about. They just wanna know what gets you out of bed in the morning. With that said, I know it can still feel overwhelming. You're probably asking yourself, what does get me out of bed in the morning? Back when I was applying, UCA was a one-man show, and Bob helped me talk through my passion, strengths, and the stories I was most proud of. He helped me design an application that was able to best capture and highlight who I was, an application 
I was proud to send in. In the span of just one month, yes, I started mid-November 12th grade, I was able to complete and send out 14 applications. I highly recommend against waiting that long to start your applications, but you may get my point. When it was overwhelming, having a professional help me simplify it. But just as no two people are exactly alike, no two Stanford at students are exactly alike either. Take a deep breath. Reflect on the things that matter to you and the things that make you who you are and tell your unique story because they want the whole person. They want you. Thank you, Connor. Next up we have Yaley, and since I went to Harvard, I can say it that way. Um, little Mikey Boxstalker, Mike Strobel, who wrote an essay that, well, he likes comic books and there was a bit of humor, but um, I'm sure that's not everything. Mike, you've been at Yale for a while. You went through the process. What kind of advice do you have? Sure. So I think, um, well, I think what Natalia said, I really liked maybe just because we've been watching a lot of it here, but what she said about it being like a Shark Tank pitch was really good. I would agree, you know, 100% with that. And the way, I mean, the one thing you notice kind of every Shark Tank pitch, it's a similar format, but it's a little different each time. Each person presents the product a little differently. Some people bring out kids, some people bring out dogs, whatever, but they're giving it some kind of unique spin. And I think that's really important. What I, the advice I would give for, especially when you sit down to write the essay, think about, like, I, I, like uh, Bob said, I wrote about, I have, I've been a comic book collector for years. I used to work at a comic book store. That's something a little different about me. Not a lot of people my age have that. It's not academic or anything like that. But try to think about something that's a little bit unique about you, a little bit different about you, and try to think about why you are that way not just you know oh I do this and not a lot of people do it okay that's good but why do you do that why does it mean so much to you and how has it kind of impacted your life how does that make you who you are so that would kind of be my uh, two cents on that was Yale worth it buddy I think so I mean I was you know now I'm back home with the coronavirus but I, I was having a good time definitely um you know a lot of fun a lot of always something to do on campus. Um, yeah, no, I, I had a good time. You notice that Michael did not say a thing about his academics just now. Just saying. By the way, I was in talking to the admissions reps, I kind of got the, the, the latitude of how far you can go in this. And, and please understand, uh, you don't necessarily need to be expressed in how great you are. Usually implication works better. So on the one hand, what they want is indeed authenticity. And they'll even look past an essay that's not whoo-hoo, because they're trying to find the student, not the essay. On the far side, I heard two things. Number one, don't be too full of yourself. They don't really like that. You're a teenager. Number two, avoid the things that you might not say to other people. As Sophia, who used to be at Harvard, said, don't give me cringeworthy. But if you can stay away from, oh my God, that's so bad, and oh my God, that's so over the top, you'll probably be fine. So relax a little bit. In fact, the essays that are trying to be too perfect, we call restrained or template. It just doesn't work. So I'm glad to hear what everybody had to say, but I'd also like to hear some questions. Uh, I know we have a lot of them. So Bill, if you will give our audience questions to us and we'll see how everybody responds. Uh, sure, let's, uh, uh, we had a couple questions that came in before uh, today's call, uh, today's uh, webinar, and uh, just, just over overlapping with what people are asking. Um, best time to start applying to colleges, given that the Common App is now open. Okay, um, it's a little trickier this year in the sense that I'm not so sure that the deadlines won't change. Uh, pretty much they change every year. Now, typically there are November 1 deadlines for phase one or what we sometimes call early and then somewhere around January 1 for the most selective schools. But, you know, if there's a weather thing, they'll give you more time. If you've got the sniffles, they'll give you more time. Um, it's at least the private schools. Now, typically people freak out because, oh, the Common App's open. What do I do? Um, they just got back to work. Typically, they're going around the country. Not sure that being first is the best. I'm also not sure that being last is the best. Uh, there is no perfect time. 
we do point our students towards certain times. Let's call it October 1. Let's call it a month before our deadline, roughly, because you don't want to be the very last person. They're more tired and it doesn't look like you really care. But here's what's definitely important. Not earlier, better. You will be shocked at how long they don't spend on your application. I was talking to a rep from Vanderbilt last week and was told that they spend five minutes on your application and that's for a top 20 school. Seven minutes if they totally love you, which isn't very long. In fact, on certain days, they will review 60 applications every day for months. They're going very quickly. In a sense, they're skimming. But most importantly, understand this. You're only getting one shot at this. And as much as there's this idea, ooh, let's apply early, it's gonna give me a coupon. Unless you're an athlete who's already been picked or a legacy who gets a little bit of a bump, it's not really gonna affect you. You don't really get a coupon. And what's strange is that everybody wants to apply early because the statistics, which the colleges give you, the statistics say that you get an advantage when you really don't. In many ways, it's a disadvantage. If you've got a really difficult school, would you rather give them your first version of your work, which is the least mature, or a better version that happens after you've got practice? Our attitude is this. We want to kind of target you for the best possibility, and it's different from school to school and student to student, but it starts with doing quality work. So as Natalia said, and Connor also said, don't wait to the last minute. Um, and that will cut down on the stress too. If you do great work, your odds go up. So instead of focusing on when, focus on how. And the word interview came up from a few of our panelists today. And we have a couple of questions here about what makes for a good interview. Uh, so is any of you looking back on your, I, I, I'd, love, I'd love to hear about some of your interview experiences and what you thought. I can hop well. in here. Yeah, hop in, Aunt Natalia. Because um, so by the way, Natalia's interview saved her $100,000, just saying. I would not be at USC had that interview not gone um, as well as it did. And again, just like I did in my essay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be very transparent here. I had good SAT and ACT scores. I had a good GPA, but by no means did I have a perfect SAT or ACT, and I hadn't started a company, a business, any, you know what I mean? I was... I was a good student, I had a great resume, but I was not perfect, okay? So I'm so grateful that they decided to interview me in the first place. But when I got in that room, I think what really happened was one, I prepared, I had conversation points to talk about. I remember in the hotel room the night before, my mom and I were researching you know, news with USC, what research were they doing? What are you know, professors in my department um, working on really cool things that I could talk about in the interview and say, hey, I'm paying attention to what's going on at USC and I care and I want to be a part of this. Um, number two, I was professional, but I was very much myself. I was talking to someone as if, you know, just like a normal person, you have to relax a little bit and do the mock interviews as uncomfortable as they may be, you know, ask different people other than maybe your parent, um, you know, force yourself into some uncomfortable situations to just practice talking to people and thinking on your feet. Um, and then something else that I'll say is the way USC, or at least the Marshall School of Business, where I was originally accepted into, the way that they go about their interviews is they have one professor, one faculty member, and one current student who sit in, in on the interview. So I've been on the interviewing side and I can't speak for other schools, but this is how it, how it went. We walked into a room, their application was on the table in a folder. We had a couple of minutes, a few minutes between interviews to skim over their resume, their essay. So we're pulling out some major details like, okay, they're a football player, they did this, they did this, good score, whatever. The majority of the interviewers votes on you is really based on you as a person. So again, that should come out already in your application. But if you have the chance to interview, just be yourself, like make them like you. Um, as they're reading your application, make them smile, make them feel something, make them, 
not just skim past the paper that they can toss away. And then when you're in the room with them, make sure that they feel something from your presence and your conversation, something that they'll say, oh, I really liked her. I really liked him. You want them to just like you. It's just, it's a personality thing in a lot of cases. Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we give our students mock interviews. In fact, we prepare them for the relaxation, if you will, or the comfort by making everybody call us by first name so they don't feel subordinate. Um, and it was a good idea to bone up on USC, but I think you know, and we always testify, so to speak, that they're really trying to find you. So instead of worrying too much about what they may interrogate you with, because it probably didn't feel like an interrogation when you did it, yeah. nor do you want to be an interrogator as the interviewer, yeah. um, you worry more about your answers. It's amazing how people forget their own answers. Hey, do you like music? Love music. Like what? Oh, I don't know, all kinds of music. Like what? Um, any particular bands or artists? Uh, really? It's in your phone. You should know this. And so while people are boning up, they're forgetting that the questions are really about you. And between you and the interviewer, you know all those answers. They don't. And Michael, of course, went through the interview stuff what was, well, you had several interviews. What were they all the same? Were they different? What was the similarities? What do you have to tell us? Yeah. So I would say that kind of, I mean, you have to adjust a little, it's a little like kind of improv because you have to adjust to the person, you know, the different interviewers have different personalities. So some, you know, there was one interview that, excuse me, interviewer that wanted to ask me more, a little bit more about like, you know, academic type stuff. The interview that I probably felt went the best, I ended up talking with a guy for uh, about uh, the movie Deadpool for 15 minutes. And so, you know, you have different interviewers, so you have to be ready to adjust. But the way I always kind of approached it is not that you're trying to impress them or, you know, like, oh, my God, they're going to leave saying, oh, my God, this is the best person, you know, ever that we have to let them in but that you want to kind of befriend them. You want to leave them, you get, you know, it's like the, the rule of comedy, always leave them wanting more. And that's definitely uh, how I went into the interview. You know, what, see what they want to talk about. If you find some kind of common ground, great. You know, you say, oh, I like this singer. Oh, I like this singer too. Great. Talk about that singer. Don't worry. Don't worry about talking about the, the school will come up. The things that they, they have questions they have to ask you. The school will come up. Certain things will come up let the conversation flow really naturally and try to befriend them, you know, not in like, Oh, we're, you know, going to go out for drinks later, but you want, you want, you want the best way I would sum up what I'm trying to say here is you want to be someone that they want to talk to again in a non-interview setting. Well, you know, you said, well, we're not going to go out for drinks later. Um, actually, when I used to interview for Harvard, I kind of wanted to find students that after they graduated and became legal age, we could be at the alumni functions and have drinks together. That's what I wanted. And Bill did it for Princeton. Um, and certainly seeing it from the consultant side, it's a little different. But what did you learn just by being an interviewer for uh, the Big Orange? Uh, well, I'll say a few things. Um, you would not believe uh, the difference that a good interview can make. You can tell right away. I always felt that I owed it to a 17, 18 year old who had taken the time out of his or her day to meet with me at a Panera, uh, some strange guy that they had you know, never heard of before. I felt I owed that person at least 20 to 25 minutes out of respect. And I can't tell you how many times it was difficult to get to those 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, and there was nothing deadlier than sort of saying, well, what's your favorite class? Math. Well, well, okay, tell me what you like about math. Uh, I just find it really interesting. Uh, you know, to Michael's point, you need to think about uh, what it is that makes you special, what, it make, what makes you unique, what makes you uh, somebody that I'm actually going to remember uh, and want to advocate for. And when you get that person where you, you hit it off, and some of it's just dependent on having overlapping interests. I mean, uh, you know, I, I was a theater person in my first career. So yes, if I meet a theater person, we're going to naturally have more overlap. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. Um, I, I can remember an interview that went about an hour and a half uh, with somebody who just had so much fun stuff to talk about that, you know, I mean, at a certain point, I'm just looking at my clock going, oh, I was supposed to look at my daughter. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, she's not 
strange in the rain or anything. Uh, bad father, bad father. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's, she's, like she's all right now. Uh, but uh, if if you can be uh, that one interview that we get a year uh, as alumni interviewers, um, you know, we just we do several a year, and I, so many of them, we were, you know, it's a struggle. And you get that one that you that you respond to is so exciting to get home and write that report. You sort of can't I, wait uh, to tell the school about the. That I student. remember uh, interviewing a guy. Uh, for two hours. And by the way, the UCA record tied by two. Uh, they had interviews of two hours and 45 minutes. If you're talking for two hours, and 45 minutes, that's fun. So I'm talking to this guy for two hours and I got home and there's a place on the form for her to put additional information. And I put the all caps on and I said, stop, read this. This is the best interview I've had in 20 years. If you don't take this boy, I am personally going to fly to Cambridge and slap you upside the head. Just do it. Trust me. And my wife's like, you can't write that. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can. The interviewers really can push you over because of their fervor and energy and the want. And when Martins is talking about Noma's interviews, well, Martins wasn't there. So Noma's clearly gushing. Martins, what was it like when Noma's came back from his, his best interviews? How did he feel? What did he look like? He, he had them. Um... You know, he was admitted to Columbia, as you know, also, where the sister studies. Um, of course, Cornell, Yale, and UMKC. Of those interviews, he was more excited about Yale because, of course, that, is, that was his choice. When he came back, he said, I was very, that was his first interview, but he came back with less than two, uh, two days preparation. You remember we called last yeah. minute because the interview came up with an impromptu. So because he wanted this, you know, Norma is a kid that likes to sleep. You know, he sleeps a long time. But once the interview came up, he was so ready, prepared. He came back and said, look, I think this guy, this lady was nice. And the implication from the report, which I sent to you, um, Bob, you remember, was that they were discussing about how the interviewer wished Norma was in school when... Uh, her kids will go to the same high school. <laughs> and the interviewer was looking forward to watching uh, his last uh, presentation, the theater presentation. So the report was very good. The same thing with UMKC. UMKC was a little bit different because it's the accelerated uh, BAMD program. That was more rigorous because they had to go through different sets of interview. But again, because he was interested in the medical program, he took every time to take part in the interview and did very well. You know, he was admitted, as you know, to UMKC BAMD program. But of course, because his priority has always been to go to Yale, he chose to go to Yale. So- Yeah, what, Yale, why is that Yale thing again? Come on, man, you're killing me. Harvard, well, don't you see it on the wall? Well, that's what he wanted. I mean, Michael knows why. <laughs> <laughs> no accountant, the kids, what are you going to do? Hey, Bill, we have a lot of other questions. So uh, lead us towards uh, some of the other inquiries from the audience. Uh, let's try and combine a few questions here about extracurricular activities. Um, how many you did? Uh, were you pursuing uh, breadth versus depth? Um, yeah, what, what, what would your sort of advice be? Uh, sort of throw this out to any of you, really, because... Uh, yeah parents as well as uh, recent students. Let's start with Jeff. He's been quiet. Uh, what, what did Jack do uh, to get into what's really an amazing college? Well, he uh, did well in school, which is uh, a good start. Uh, good SAT scores. He played on the tennis team. He was involved with community activities. Um, he uh, was a part of the fanfare at school, the student newspaper. Um, he did a lot of things outside of the classroom that I think helped him with his application. Um, and I think what's important that isn't, hasn't really been talked about yet is Jack made a personal connection with many of his teachers at school and got some good recommendations from his teachers at school um, who 
um, saw not only that um, Jack um, uh, was interested in that particular class that he was taking, but that he was a curious kid. Uh, he was interested not only about the class um, at hand, but that he was interested about just learning in general. Um, and I think that resonated with um, some of the teachers uh, at his high school um, who um, took a personal interest and uh, wrote him some good recommendations um, that certainly helped him a lot. Um, and Yeah, I, I think that's an amazing point because people, we, we tell the 11th graders the four things to focus on, grades, extracurriculars, tests, and the teachers. Those recommendation letters are literally the last thing they read before they decide, and that can either lift you up or drop you down. I call it the Game of Thrones syndrome. Everybody loved Game of Thrones until the last season wasn't any good. Nobody talks about Game of Thrones anymore. And so that that's uh, very sharp. And I think before talking about what each specific person did, um, I want to give you the four factors that they use to evaluate. And it's pretty simple. You won't need to write these down. The first is how long you've done something. If you've done it for 10 years, it's better than 10 weeks or 10 days. Number two, how well you've done. This is not about quantity, it's about quality. So if you're president, it's better than being a participant. If you win the Olympic gold medal, it's better than being on the Jamaican bobsled team, Mon, because they're really not that good. So how well you do. Number three, making an impact, not just absorbing for yourself, but doing something for others. And they quite literally are looking geographically. International is the best, and you will be competing against international students and actual Olympians. National, more local, within your high school, and for the couch potatoes, the couch isn't a very good geographic thing. But how long, how well, how far the impact, and the last one, originality. If you want to be different, you want to be picked, you want to be selected because they see you in a different way, you have to be different. Whether it's creativity, originality, or innovation, do something that makes you separate. I remember talking to Andre in our office a couple of years ago. He said, I think I got somebody who's really hot for, for Penn. I think she's a good candidate. And I said, why does Penn need her? That's all I need to know. No answer. So in looking at your extracurriculars, sometimes we talk about well-rounded and sometimes we talk about well lopsided. Go deep, do something qualitatively different be yourself, follow your own thing. Natalia, what did you do that made you so special? I, I, don't, I don't know all the things, but I'll tell you what I did. Um, I was involved in a lot of the like standard honor societies. So like NHS, National Honor Society, the Spanish Honor Society, basically anything that I could you know, easily check a box for go ahead and do it. It's a no-brainer not to. Um, I was like the vice president of the National Honor Society. So that was, I thought, looked pretty good. But I'd say the thing that probably sold them for me and that most aligned with my personal thesis and, again, my brand was I really loved journalism. So I went deep into journalism. And I had written for the online newspaper, the print newspaper, and then eventually yearbook. And I'd done it all four years of my high school experience. And then the last two years, I was the editor in chief. And then I was able to talk about, I you know, started this initiative for the journalism staff, or I managed 30 people and met you know, however many deadlines, published however many yearbooks. So again, to Bob's point about, I, I did scatter myself with other interests and in like other clubs, but I chose one club or one organization, one extracurricular to really focus on and made that where I put my time and energy and tried to make an impact there. Michael, I don't want to call you comic book guy, but tell us about your, uh, I, I'm so glad Natalia didn't say high school career because that's a pet peeve, your high school <laughs> experience. Sure. No, I, honestly, comic book guy is, is, is pretty fair. I, um, I worked at the comic book store about three years and not in any kind of big position. I was stocking the shelves. Um, I did, I had a nonprofit and that was also comic book related where I would kind of teach vocabulary words using different superheroes to, you know, kindergarten age kids. That was a lot of fun. Um, I also was the head of a sketch comedy group and I did newspaper for a little bit junior year. Did so your parents tell you to do all that stuff? 
No, they did not. The only, I actually had to fight. <laughs> well, not, I didn't have to fight with them, but I, um, a lot of, they told you not to do that stuff. A little bit. The, the, they, there was a point where they were, you're we spending a little too much time at the comic book store. And ultimately I, I have to say, I think that's what got me in more than anything else. But um, seriously, listen to what he just said, mom and dad, don't go to the comic book store. Actually, that's what got me to Yale. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I did that. And the thing I would say to just in my experience, at least is, you know, you're people are interested in, in different things, and you're going to do different things. You know, there's not much relationship between like, working at the comic book store and doing sketch comedy. They're, they're not similar. The thing to do is kind of find like something similar in you that attracts you to both. So like a quality that attracts what what's one thing about you that made you want to do all of these different things, like find the common ground and then kind of present that. That's really well put. We often have students say, I do this and I do this and they don't, they don't match. Well, they do match because you like them both. There is this commonality and it's, it's a bit of self-awareness. All right. What else we got, Bill? Well, I was just going to say, now that you're on campus or at least we're on campus up until March, um, most of the students on your campuses, I'm guessing, are engaged in extracurriculars and engaged in activities. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just the kind of thing that people that people do, um, and it's no longer being required uh, because whatever grad school or job you apply to is going to ask you to list your activities. Uh, it's what, what what you find. So, uh, question came up about what if I don't necessarily have extracurriculars. I'm guessing you have something, whether or not it's organized. Comic book store was not an organized club that Michael went to at a club fair to sign up for, but he found something to do uh, that, that matched with the kind of stuff he was interested in doing. Um, do not get wed to, it must be a club, it must be a proper organization. Um, let's see. Um, Is it normal to get your essay back and uh, feel that it isn't good enough? By normal, do you mean Norm normal? Normal to put your personal statement and feel that it over ninety percent of the time. <laughs> uh, yes and no. Uh, these are hard, and so we've had to create a different process to get people to that level, and we're very, very, very grateful and, and thankful that the process works. And a lot of our students will say, "I love my essay," and I think both Natalia and, and Michael, and I know Connor did because she told me that. Um, it is very common for the parents to say that. That's because this is not what you think. It is not more about your extracurriculars. It is not more about the qualifications. The purpose of the essay is to add something else, and that's to understand the person. See, the difference in these schools is that they're looking for a community because they understand the, the spread of information that happens when people from all around the world with different ideas, different philosophies, different experiences, when they're together, they talk and they train each other. So they're looking for people who have qualifications, but that's not why they do it. They pick you because they're trying to see if you're a contributor. Are you a catalyst or are you a cancer? I know that there's lots of smart kids in the world and some of them just don't talk very much, and that doesn't really help an interactive environment. And some of the kids in maybe your high school class who are really smart are kind of jerks. They're not looking for that either. They're looking for somebody who can contribute. And so we're always messaging. I mean, every year, Bill and Bob and Andre and Emmy and Erme and Amy, and we have a lot of A sounds, sorry. But uh, we always sit around, how can we explain this a little better? Um, and we're getting up to about 50% of the people pay attention. Uh, but yes, it is often feels unfulfilling in the early stages. Again, we've designed a, a method that takes maybe that last 10% and it has to do with the structure of words, not the changing of words. Because writing has two parts, drafting and editing. And I know, for example, that when Natalia and Michael did what we call a speed draft, they looked at it and they're like, what is this? But that's to get the natural voice, to be conversational. What you want to avoid is perfection. And at this age, people are not editing, they're rewriting, they're reworking the same stuff. Wait, I'll change that, I'll change. It's not changing, it's adjusting. So if you're not fulfilled, don't 
re rewrite it, tweak it. You may need some help from outside sources. Clearly we do quite a bit of that, but the good news is this, in talking to the admissions people, they're not that concerned that it's not world-class. They're looking for the person, not the essay. So they're looking in between the lines. They're looking at the recommendations and the questions and the other stuff, the whole thing. They're quite little, and I asked them, I said, what happens when an essay just lies there? Like, we know, it's okay. We're not looking for the essay. We're looking for the person. Uh, probably segue into another question here, uh, which I'll try and phrase a little more broadly. Uh, what kind of answers are schools looking for on their short essay questions? Uh, those of you who are uh, headed into application season, uh, those of you who are a little younger might only be aware of the main essay, the personal statement. Uh, there are a lot of school-specific essays uh, that uh, are, are required as well. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll yeah, like Stanford has like 12 um, and includes a lot of 50 worders. I know Yale does, and Michael had to fill those out. Um, I, my short answer, what answers are they looking for? Yours. Michael, what did you write in your short ones? Because those are kind of the hardest. Um, I don't know. It's a, it was a, you know, it was a few years ago, but... Um, <laughs> it's two years ago. <laughs> you can dig about it. Three, three. But um, no, I, I mean, I think if the personal essay is kind of like, who are you? This is sort of the, like, tell me a little bit more about yourself. You know, what's, you're getting into the minutia of you because they already know broadly your, your personality, that sort of thing. So this is a chance to, you know, tell a little anecdote or, you know, a little story about your family, something like that, your friends, something you did, something like that, that, you know, it really goes back into, they have the, I would say the personal essay, they have the outline. This is the coloring in. This is the filling in, so that they can really see who you are in a more specific sense. Yeah, there, there's basically longer essays of 650 or up to 800 for Tulane. Um, Mid-sized essays around 250 plus or minus than the 50 worders. One of the most famous supplemental essays is the Stanford essay. Write a letter to your roommate. I can't imagine what it must be like to be a Stanford admissions rep because here's how most of them come to us. Hi, Rumi, can't wait to meet you and take over the world. We're gonna do this, we're gonna go to this spot on Stanford that I just found on the website. Da -da -da. We're gonna take over the world. Besties for life. Can't wait to see you in the fall. Excuse me, no. No, you're trying to figure out what they want and that's not what they want. What they're looking for is you. And sometimes, take a chance. It's really fine. Now, Natalia, did you get a chance to either write or edit short ones and what works and what doesn't? Yeah, um, I think, like, don't try too hard. Like, I, I don't know, like Michael said, it's that coloring in and that coloring in has personality and you can be funny, you can be quirky. You know, if they ask you, tell me about your favorite TV show, you don't, you don't need to think about, oh, what do they want me to say? You know, they, they want me to talk about this. No, 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 just completely be yourself. Don't hold back. and. I'm not going to say that the writing can be more casual. You need to be careful, obviously, but your personality should really be showing through. And I know all of us keep saying that a lot mm -hmm. and it's redundant, but that's the whole point. Like your entire application needs to speak for you because you're not going to be there. It's like how, if you were in the room, what would you, how would you want to portray yourself? And that's just another opportunity to be concise and, um, I don't know, make every word count because it is a lot shorter. So don't fill it with fluff. Don't try to be just an eloquent writer. Just get to the point and get your personality across. I want to share with everybody um, a Yale short answer by a student um, who got into Yale, decided to go to UNC because they offered him the Moorhead Scholarship, which was kind of awesome. Uh, and I got to tell you, there are four 35 worders on the Yale application, and his first three were really good. I mean, he's a political guy and a world changer, and he talks about all these cool stuff. And then his fourth one, I said, is a beauty pageant speech. What are you doing? So we had to change it. So I want to read for you what the final result was, along with the prompt. Most Yale freshmen live in suites of four to six students. What would you contribute to the dynamic of your suite? Coconut green rice. Although my empathetic ear is always available to discuss academic disaster 
and dating issues. In between cathartic gym sets, my family's home recipes always provide nourishment for the body and the soul. Now, that's not the type of thing that most people think works. It totally does. Just be yourself. Uh, I'm going to lump together a few other. There, there, there are various questions about uh, should I do the optional essay on an application? Should I do the optional recommendation letter? Should I do, uh, I would say generally, yes, you are trying to give them a reason to take you. Those of us who are not Olympic gold medalists, those of us who do not win the National Spelling Bee, need to do a little more uh, to let them take you. Don't go overboard on the recommendation letters. Um, the one thing that we'll put an asterisk on here, uh, there's an optional COVID question this year on the Common App. And I know I can't throw this question out to any of you because you don't have to deal with it, thankfully. Um, generally speaking, and Bob, you've had some intelligence on this. This seems to be the question that admissions officers are using so they don't have to read all about the coronavirus on your personal statement. You are absolutely right. Com common application, put in a, hey, if you want to say something about COVID, put it here. Not there. It is optional. If you have something awesome to say, not just, I did this cool thing that I could have put on my activities list, fine. But it better be awesome because you're taking their time. Same thing with a section that's always been on the Common App known as additional information. This is not more of the same. This is designed to explain things that cannot be explained elsewhere. So as a general proposition, if a university has its own supplement that is optional, take the shot, but you better do a good job. On the common portion, the stuff that they say is optional, they really mean it's optional. You don't wanna overdo it and run a risk. Because what if they like you, and all of a sudden you wrote something they don't like? Just saying. Yeah, the point I would make, if you did something awesome, you discovered a vaccine, you might want to put that down. Uh, if, uh, if you had something very disruptive, you were actually caring for a family member with, you might want to put that down because you're trying to explore. But, you know, if, uh, if you're going to put down that your school closed in mid-March and you had to do online learning, so did everybody else on the planet. Don't waste your time. <laughs> Uh, at, at, at that point. Um, uh, how important is the high school selection for where you eventually want to be in college? IB versus AP versus boarding school. Um, Natalia, Michael, is there only one type of student on your campus? No, no, they come from all over. It's, you, you got to figure out what's going to work best for you and, you know, prioritize like your happiness and your well-being too. And just do what works best for you and make the most of your time at whatever school you're at. Yeah, I mean, people are getting in from all kinds of, I mean, my first year I had my three sweet mates, one went to boarding school, one went to public school, one went to private school. So literally three different, <laughs> three different backgrounds just right there. So what, what we always say is because look, the admissions people will say this, the choice of school is the choice of the parent, not the student. The performance within the school is the choice of the student. Now, Martins, you chose a public high school, a very good one, a top 100. Uh, Jeff, you chose a prep school, a very good one, probably one of the top 100. Why did you make those decisions? And are you happy with those decisions? Well, speaking for, for myself, um, it's the same high school that I went to. So it was a sort of a normal, f natural fit for jack to go there because i was familiar with the school i had a good experience there and um and i knew the education that jack would be getting there um and he enjoyed his experience there he um made lots of good friends there but most importantly i think um other than the friends there um knowing that jack was a curious kid and loved to learn i knew that he would be surrounded by other kids there who shared the same interests uh that he did and um i thought that it would give him the best opportunity to thrive and to um express himself the best way um and it was a good fit for him and ultimately i think what everybody's talking about is um, what is the best school um, in terms of the best fit for the particular student? 
And it really starts uh, in high school as well, whether or not a public school is going to be a better fit or a private school is a better fit or boarding school is a better fit. Ultimately, it's about the individual student and where are they going to be provided the best opportunity to thrive. Um, and so for Jack, it was the high school that he went to, but if another child, it could be a different school. It's all about the individual child and where the best fit is for that student. And his private school was the best fit for him. Yeah, you know, um, uh, locally, uh, IB is very popular. Internationally, IB is very popular. Martin's had the choice between sending his schools, kids to a school that was AP or IB, and he chose AP. It seemed to work out okay. Martin's, why did you do that? Uh, first of all, I would like to talk as to how we even got this far. Uh, we started from Louisiana, as you probably know. We moved from Louisiana to Florida um, in 2002. And prior to that time, our kids were always in private schools. And I decided with my wife that the problem would be keeping them in private school and not having the opportunity for them to expose to real world because we believe that they are too sheltered in private schools based on our experience in Louisiana. And the only reason why we put them in private school in Louisiana is because most of the public schools were not good. I mean, that's my own impression. So we wanted them to have the best education there. So when we moved to Tampa, we were looking at a school that will be public school that will give them some real life experience, but also that will have either AP or IB, but with some specific uh, subjects. One of the reasons why we settled for Plant High School was because Plant High School is among those public schools in Hillsborough County that actually offers Latin. So we wanted them to have that background. I'm a lawyer, I practiced law for over 25 years. My wife is a lawyer also, and I have brothers and doctors, you know. So we realized that if they studied something like Latin, they will have a background for professional studies. And then we also looked at a school that was competitive and Plant, uh, in our opinion, was one of the best, actually the best in Hillsborough County. Then we made that sacrifice to buy a house in the district and it worked out. So that is something that a parent will have to decide uh, at some point. But in my opinion, ultimately, it's about the child. You know, they will struggle more if they didn't go to a competitive school. But if they go to competitive schools, they'll be able to come out stronger ultimately. That, I mean, that's my own experience. Yeah. In making decisions, try not to navigate a college process that is changing all the time. In fact, today, the Justice Department accused Yale of discrimination. Try to pick something from the perspective of being a parent. If you raise the best possible human being, that person is also the best applicant. Yes. Uh, we talked about reaching out to admissions offices. What sort of questions should you be emailing or calling them from? I'll tell you what we won't do. I'm not going to give you a forum of questions to ask them because then you'll sound like everybody else. Well, here's what they want. Real questions. Their job is to help you. They want to create a relationship. Almost think of it as we're already here. How does this work? So ask them things that you want to know. Don't try to impress them. The purpose of these calls is not really to impress them. It's to help make you more impressive and make you make a better decision. So things like, how does this thing I've read about really work? Can I do this? When they get real questions, they are so happy. Uh, I remember five years ago calling MIT. And I said, look, I have a sense of what's going on. I just want to talk to you about how you guys do what you do. We were on the phone for an hour and 45 minutes. They were so happy just to have an intelligent conversation. So instead of looking for in Google list of questions to ask admissions reps or interviewers, ask your questions. Always keep it authentic and that works. A couple of years ago, we had a girl who was applying to Wharton. And I said, look, if you need to really understand, you need to do your research. And that does include looking at the internet, but it also includes doing original research, not just collecting stuff. I want you to call the admissions office. And she did. She texted me back. 
I spoke to a student. I said, oh, I'm sorry. She goes, no, it was great. It was a Wharton student. We talked about everything that happens. It's exactly what I thought. I'm so excited. She just graduated from Wharton. Jeff, I'm guessing in the course of Jack's research, a question or two might have come up from, from his mind about one or two schools. Oh, sure. And uh, Jack reached out to uh, various chat groups at uh, different schools. Um, and it was very helpful for him because the sense of, of the vibe at the school. He asked kids what they did on weekends. He asked kids uh, what they did for fun. Um, not just about academics, but about uh, the broader spectrum of the school and, and, and what's the larger experience of going to various schools and uh, so yeah he um he definitely looked into that as well you know you uh you said what i do on weekends i kind of have a standard question for those people who are taking campus tours and i guess you could apply it to this i don't care what you do on weekends i pretty much know what they're gonna do on weekends you know what i want to know what do you do on wednesday night what's the rest of the time look like what's the vibe at the place and i think that Pretty much any question is good, as long as it's real. And I think Bill can answer this from an interviewer point of view, and I certainly can. Those fake questions designed to kind of impress somebody. One was something about along the lines of, so why do you do this? What did you really like about your school? I said, you know what I really like about Harvard? The ability to interview people like you and slap them out of the class for asking stupid questions. <laughs> That's what I really wanted to say. I never did. But just be real. What, what, what was your favorite thing about uh, your time at Princeton? And, and my, I would just go into autopilot with my standard answer. Yeah, figuring out how I'm going to fill out this interview port to make sure you don't get in. Uh, I've had a few questions about financial aid. Should you fill out the FAFSA even if you're not sure you qualify for financial aid? Uh, how are schools doing need-based uh, financial aid? Um, or need blind financial aid, I should say. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of how the college education is generally funded? Yeah, um, for those who don't know, FAFSA is a form where the parents fill out the financial information. There's another one called the CSS profile. Um, though, and you can look online and you get a sense using a net price calculator, which every school has to have. It's a federal law. Um, and you get a general sense of whether you'll get what we call financial aid. And that's help because the family doesn't have money. Then there's merit aid, which is based more on the student than the parents. And that could be anything from an academic scholarship to a football scholarship to a, we just want somebody from your part of the world thing. It's not really a scholarship, by the way. It's a discount. How are we going to get you into this university today? It's kind of one of those things. But do you fill out the forms? It's a general proposition. Yes. Because certain things that you might want to apply to later, that form will be required, even if it's not a financial aid thing, it could be another scholarship, and it gets into the system. And it's very helpful because if you don't have it, you just won't qualify for the scholarship. There's another hidden thing. Now, this started about two years ago. Like I said, it's an industry, and U.S. News has rankings, and they have an algorithm, and they mess with it, and certain very strong universities uh, help rearrange the algorithm. One of the things that they did was include a 20% factor called social mobility. Essentially, they are encouraging universities to accept more low socioeconomic families, more Pell Grant people, more people who cannot pay. Um, so as they're taking more, the cost of the class is still the same. That means they're gonna need the rest of the people to pay more. And truth, there is need blind, but there's also need aware, and most schools are need aware. Truth is this, if you don't qualify for financial aid and your FAFSA proves it, they might actually like you better. But don't overthink it. It's an opportunity. We generally say, go ahead and do it unless there's some reason not to. Um, but that's a more personalized question that we can help with you one-on-one. -on -one. Bill, I think we have time for one more. All right, uh, I'm going to rephrase this question because uh, otherwise it's uh, too much of a setup for a sales pitch and we try not to make these too salesy. Uh, the question is, when should you start working with UCA? I'm going to phrase it as, uh, when should you start thinking seriously about, uh, about your college choices and, and directing yourself towards college? Um, since all of you have had that experience of 
yeah, I know it's not a, a light bulb moment. It's it's more of a gradual process. But when 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 did uh, college applications in your memory start to become a, a real present thing in your life? Well, well Martin, I think. Year. Oh, sorry. What, what, no, I was just going to say to Martin that he seemed to have a different experience with Desi versus Noma because Noma tagged along with Desi. So, kind of mentally, he had started the process a little earlier. Is that right? Yes. Actually, I don't think it's a sales uh, question. I think it's very, very important for parents to know the reason why they need to get help. I don't say this because I want you guys to retain UC, but to know that you need help. More of the time you realize that the kids don't listen to parents and if you can give the questions or whatever you want to resolve through a group like UCA do it as soon as possible thinking on when to apply and how to get the resources is from the time the child starts high school start planning it especially if it's a child that really has the desire to go to a competitive school and is competitive. You want to prepare them. There's no other way to do it. It's so tough out there that even when you prepare them, you can't guarantee the admission. So it's better to start it early from wherever their courses they're taking based on their interests and the extracurricular activities. Like I said, in the case of Norma, he won't listen. I mean, he wanted to do all his extracurricular activities. Bob said, look, let him do what he wants. Let him go deep. We let him do it and it worked out. If I didn't have somebody like, you know, uh, Bob, who told me, look, relax, don't push him out. Probably I would have gone to the theater instructor and said, look, my child should stop this program. So the sooner you get into it, the better, because you've heard something about the essays. These are not just easy stuff to put together. Whether it's the long essay or the short ones, you need to start putting together their life changing experiences from the beginning. Because when it's time for application, they might not remember. They need to actually reach out to those uh, teachers and be good students for the teachers to be able to recommend them properly. And those guidance, even how those will be you know, developed, you can get from a university counselor. So the sooner you get it, the better, I would recommend. Well, I, I look at it a different way because we see people of all ages. I always say the ninth grade is for the parents. The kids just started high school and they're looking at us like, well, I'm talking to a college person, seriously. And that doesn't exactly help the relationship. Uh, somewhere around grade 10, they're starting to think, I know I should be doing more. I don't really know what. They've gotten used to high school a little bit. And then the relationship can really start. And my favorite time is somewhere in 10th grade because we can help, help you grow and develop and build the resume, even though that's not what it is. For the actual application effort, I would take a look at January-ish of grade 11, because there's some prep you want to do before the summer so you can use your summer most wisely. Now, Natalia was about to say something, and I interrupted her. Sorry. What did you have in mind? Well, I was going to say that I started with my actual application the summer before senior year. Um, so, you know, don't be discouraged if you're a little, if, if you're not starting super early on. I think to Bob's point, like, so much of high school is figuring out what you want to be involved in. And I mean, you're still, you're a kid, like don't, you have four years in undergrad to be a college kid. And then half of that is stressing about what you're going to do after graduation. So don't make your entire high school experience um, stressing about what you're going to do for college. Um, I do think I didn't know about UCA before, and I'm not trying to make it a sales thing either but just to be honest I didn't know about UCA before then so I think it would have been helpful in I would say maybe 10th or 11th grade to just have conversations about you know what are some other activities that maybe I should consider doing just as it's not a super stressful involved process just something to have in the back of your mind that way come end of junior year you can be all in um, junior year was a really tough year for me academically just like rigorous. I was very busy junior year. So I didn't have a lot of time or mental capacity to focus on college stuff until the summer came. And I think that was the nature of the program I was in. Um, but I mean, the earlier, the better to an extent, say after hey. the halfway mark of sophomore year. Did everybody notice how Natalia, who's still in college, talked about the high school kids? I, I'm wondering, because you get to see <laughs> some of the work that they do. Can you see the, the mature, maturation that happens from one year to the next, even in college? Oh, absolutely. 
It's crazy, right? Absolutely. So to the extent that parents are frustrated, usually because the boys are immature, and this goes out to the, to the male high school students out there. I used to think that uh, that stuff about how girls mature differently than boys is not true. It's totally true. And so for the parents of the high school males, mama, you're going to love them a lot more at the end of the 12th grade than you will. The girls are pretty, the boys are doink. And so from a parental point of view, it's really important to kind of monitor where your child is and don't overwhelm them. Don't underwhelm them. Uh, Mike, were you one of those guys who suddenly became mature in 12th grade? Um, I don't know, suddenly. It was de- I mean, definitely more so, yeah. There's de- if you look who I was in 9th grade and who I was in 12th grade, it's, it's basically two different people. Um, I stayed a little bit consistent just because I, I had, like, consistent interests. But, yeah, and I would say, too, definitely the jump from high school to college, you change a lot. But just because you have more independence, you know, doing stuff on your own. But um, yeah, no, I mean, there, there's definitely an evolution. And you, you, you know, you have to make that clear, I would say, in your application. But the thing to remember, that's not just you. You're not the only person who's changing. Everyone is, you know, it's, that's the time for it. Well, I appreciate everybody's comments today. Uh, I wish Connor could have been here, but we got some really good stuff from uh, – uh, somebody from the left coast and somebody from the right coast as students, uh, parents who have clearly uh, at least not screwed up their kids too badly with some incredible achievements. Um, this is a great job. It really is. Um, I used to be a lawyer. Martins is still a lawyer. I no, no more. And Jeff is still a lawyer. I guess I'm the only one who's quit. But I always say that I used to represent adults who are acting like children. Now I get to introduce or work with young people to make them better adults. And the best part of this job are the students, lifelong relationships. Just during this chat tonight, uh, we've been receiving um, WhatsApp calls from Jakarta, Indonesia, and text messages from throughout the United States, from people watching and some not watching, just saying, hey, what's up? Um, I'm going to be in town or or whatever. That's great. We always say that our job is getting you into college, and it is. That's not our goal. Our goal is a student's success, both in college and beyond. And if there's one thing I want you to take away, take a look at those two fine young people. Being around them is just tremendous. And we want everybody to do better. A rising tide lifts all boats. So to the extent that we're able to help the young people achieve, well, that's one of the greatest privileges we ever have. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you to all of our panelists. If you want to know more about us, we're not that hard to find. You found us already, but info at universitycoa.com. Bill, any parting comments? Uh, there, there will be a follow-up. For, for those of you who are interested in signing up with UCA, the follow-up email will have a link so you can have a free meeting with, with one of our client managers. For those of you who are already students with UCA, uh, we hope that one day you are sitting in uh, one of those chairs that uh, Michael and Natalia are in, uh, and uh, we're here to support you. Uh, and thank you, uh, Jeff and Martins, as well. Uh, this is really tremendous for us to uh, not just have to listen to Bob and Bill talk, uh, but to get some real perspectives from people who've been through this process since the internet was invented. So uh, we, we appreciate that. Enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thanks. Hope to see Bye. you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.